So I would like to start with uh, Kim. Let's just start from the beginning. I like to hear like your journey of how you got here. Oh, wow. Um, it's a little bit of a story. I'll see if I can try and give you the Reader's Digest version. Um, I lost a baby as well. It wasn't um, from malpractice. He had an interrupted aortic arch. We did not know this before he was born because ultrasound wasn't as sophisticated in those days. He was born in 1989 um, as it is now. And um, he lived for a total of 18 days, about two weeks after his surgery. And the way that I grieve or the way that I do anything when I'm dealing with something is I read. So I was, um, and I had actually, the, during the time that I was pregnant, I had become fascinated with the entire process. And I'd actually started thinking about going to medical school and becoming an obstetrician because I really was crazy about my obstetrician. As a matter of fact, I still use some of the, um, educational um, pearls that he shared with me all of those years ago in my practice. And um, so after the baby died, I was in the library looking for books about grieving. And on the end cap was a book called A Wise Birth. And it was about a nurse midwife in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And she served a lot of the Amish, which is ironic because guess where, who is a big part of my clientele now. Um, and I went, I didn't know this was even a thing. I had no idea there was such a thing as a nurse midwife. And I thought, that's it. That's what I want to do. And I guess in a, in a way that was my son's gift to me because he helped me figure out what I wanted to do. I mm -hmm. work at a small critical access hospital in a small town in Northeast Ohio. And I care for all types of women. And so in addition to mothers that are pregnant and having babies, I care for women that are going through menopause and all of the other things that nurse midwives care for. Um, cycle control, birth control, um, infections, just about anything an OBGYN will do other than surgery. And depending on the severity of the situation, if I need to consult with my boss, then I do that as well. Like if somebody's blood pressures are going up, you know, I'll go to them and say, hey, listen, I'm seeing this happening with this patient. So these are the labs I'm drawing and I'm thinking she's headed towards medication. This is what I'm thinking I'm using. And he'll say, yay or nay or yeah. And why don't you do this too? So once it, a, a woman's condition reaches a certain threshold, then I'm obligated with the scope of my practice to consult with someone who has a medical background, a medical degree, a physician. Okay. To pass off or when it's like, here's your scope of practice and when it reaches whatever, you can pass them to the, the right care that they need. Don't necessarily pass off, but I consult okay, to make sure that I'm making the right decisions. And, it, you know, he gives his two cents. And then if the condition becomes um, beyond my scope of practice, I'll actually refer over to him. So a lot of times, excuse me, <clears throat> We'll have patients that have a poor reproductive history, and because we're a small practice, I mean, we're growing. We've got a lot of patients, but as a small practice in a small hospital who can only deliver at 35 weeks and above, there's a limit to our total scope of practice as a practice. So we'll refer a lot of mothers to maternal fetal medicine who will monitor a mother during the pregnancy alongside of us. And once she gets to the end of her pregnancy at about 38, between 37 and 39 weeks, they'll decide whether or not she qualifies to deliver at our hospital. So can I ask you, looking at prenatal care, what is the things that you look at during pregnancy before you ever reach birth? What do you look for? What are the kind of symptoms, the signs? Like, why do we, why do we do all the testing, that kind of thing? I'm just curious of like, why do we have prenatal care basically? I look at the mother's weight gain. I look at how the baby is growing. Is the baby growing on a normal growth curve? If um, it doesn't seem that her fundal height, the, the size of her uterus, is consistent with the number of weeks of pregnancy, I'll refer her to maternal fetal medicine. Well, I'll get an ultrasound first and get an idea of how well the baby's growing. That ultrasound will tell me whether or not the baby's on track. Um, if not, um, I'll watch the growth for a little bit. Three weeks later, I'll do another ultrasound. If the baby's still not catching up or if the baby looks big and the baby looks like the baby's still getting bigger, I will refer. Um, I watch um, at around 28 weeks, we do testing for blood sugar to determine whether or not the mother um, is managing her own blood sugar reserves appropriately. If she's not, um, 
then obviously the baby's getting a big hit of um, blood sugar and her insulin isn't enough to manage it. So we're gonna have to watch the baby's size. She's gonna have to watch her diet, maybe go on medication. Medication, uh, if, if a woman is diet controlled with gestational diabetes, that's something that's within my scope of practice. If she's not and needs to go on medication, that's when I begin collaborating with um, my physician collaborator. Um, obviously, I watch her blood pressures. If they're starting to creep up, particularly in the early third trimester, um, particularly if she's having certain symptoms going along with those blood pressures, I'll run labs and watch them. And if those labs come back, not so great. Um, or if those pressures are staying up, I'll collaborate with my collaborator. Um, there's just so many things. Early on in pregnancy, helping manage the nausea. You know, sometimes it's a matter of um, making certain that the woman, if the physical part of her pregnancy is going well, making sure that she's in a social situation that is supportive of her in the pregnancy. Um, some women literally don't have enough to eat. You know, they don't have the resources to take a baby home to. They're in an abusive relationship. You know, um, they're struggling with mental health concerns. And so we try to find resources for them. So there's just a myriad of things that happen to a woman when she's pregnant. And this has kind of been the focus of nurse midwives all along. We don't see pregnancy as just a pregnancy. We see it in the terms of, um, in addition to the medical things that we have to keep an eye on, we look at it in terms of her entire life and what's going on. Because if she's not safe, if she doesn't have enough to eat, if she doesn't have adequate shelter, that pregnancy is going to be at risk. It's very true. So I'm, I have a question just, uh, just to kind of throw in there, but why do we have due dates? Why is there a big thing about going overdue and due dates? Because I, I see a lot of uh, natural people do this thing of like, oh, it's fine, go overdue. You can go weeks overdue and it's completely fine. So I'd like to get a perspective from you. The placenta is a temporary organ. It has a shelf life. It ages. And after 41 weeks, even though it's a very small number, the stillbirth rate skyrockets. The amount of fluid, as you unfortunately know, Danielle, um, around the baby begins to wane because the placenta can no longer filter it. The baby can no longer produce um, the fluids that he or she needs um, to support um, lung function and things like that in the lungs because the lungs expand and contract with the fluid that's in them. They do this like practice breathing mo movements. Um, the fluid, it manages waste products. It filters out sugars. I mean, it does so many things, the combination of the placenta with the fluid and the baby, but after a while it stops functioning well. And you get to a point where the baby is going to be safer on the outside than on the inside. I do want to ask, like, when you start getting toward the end and you start doing, like, your weekly appointments, because you go on from, like, your months, month to month, and then it's, like, toward the end, you start doing weekly. So what is the stuff that they're kind of looking for, maybe different changes or different things going on that might address something else that's happening that's something on with baby or mom i'm just i'm curious about that of like what is what, what are you kind of looking for right toward the end and it's not just active labor obviously but something uh -huh. else that could be going wrong um i'm looking at how the um, baby is growing because the baby's put on about a half a pound a week at the end of pregnancy so if you've got a big baby going into that last month of pregnancy you know you're kind of thinking in the back of your mind she goes to 40 weeks, what am I looking at here? <laughs> you know, other things that we're watching really closely are blood pressures and any symptoms that are going along with blood pressures as blood pressures are beginning to rise. Your blood pressure tends to um, lower in the second trimester because the progesterone that's helping to maintain the pregnancy keeps the uterus relaxed. It's also relaxing the smooth muscle on the inside of your veins and arteries and that's why your blood pressure drops. And then it comes back to a baseline in uh, mid third trimester. And that's a key time where preeclampsia, if it's going to rear its ugly head, mm. starts to rear its ugly head. I've seen it happen at 28 weeks or so, but right around 32 to 36 weeks, if it's going to happen, that's when it starts to, to happen. And so at 36 weeks, we're just watching to make sure everything is staying copacetic. Baby's growing normally, not getting too big. 
get it, but staying big enough, blood pressures are staying normal. The mother's not showing any symptoms that could go along with preeclampsia because sometimes preeclampsia is not accompanied by increases in blood pressure, but you'll hear headaches and visual changes and epigastric pain and all of these other things that can be an indication of that. I did not know that you could have preeclampsia without the, the blood pressure. That is a new one to me. I yeah. did not know that. It, it's but rare. It's I've rare. never had it. So it's, I've had nine pregnancies, but I've never had, had preeclampsia, but I still never heard that before. That's awesome. Yeah, it happens. That. It's rare, but Thanks. it can happen. Hmm. So um, after baby's born, I'm curious of like, what's the proper like newborn assessment that you guys actually do? Because obviously if you have your baby at home, you're not getting much of an assessment done on baby, but I'm curious of what is done in a hospital. Well, the first thing we, we do is if the baby is breathing okay and turning nice and pink and crying, the baby does go skin to skin with mom because we have found out that that helps baby regulate his or her temperature better. And if the mother's going to breastfeed, it does tend to kind of make that start a little bit more smoothly. But what the nurses are looking at are the baby's color, the baby's tone, the baby's respiratory effort, um, whether or not the baby is retracting. In other words, can you see the spaces between the ribs when the baby is sucking in? Um, is the baby making any noises when he or she is breathing? A lot of times, um, the nurse will be across the room and the mother will say, oh, listen, honey, he's singing. And every ear and eye in the room goes up because no, he's not. He's grunting, you know, and that says that there's extra work and breathing going on in that baby. And that happens a lot of times with babies and they work through it in the first couple of hours. But for some babies, they don't. And they need in my hospital, they end up needing to be transferred. But so you're just looking at the overall picture. You know, is the baby staying warm? Is the baby breathing without having to work too hard? Is the color good? Is the tone good? Is the baby acting like a normal, healthy baby? In the first couple of hours after birth, the baby will look around. It'll move his or her head towards his mother or father's voice. They will start going towards the breast because breast milk smells like the mother smelled on the inside. And that's just mm -hmm. nature's way of getting the baby to turn that way. So that's just an overall picture that they're looking at. Mm, I didn't know that. Well, that's interesting. Um, so I know that anybody who's had an out of hospital birth, it mm -hmm. usually goes into that, whether you're at a birth center or you're at home or you're mm -hmm. at a birth house, something like that. Usually the anticipated um, stop to care immediately after birth is a couple hours later. And then in a hospital. And then you go home or the midwife leaves, something like that. The midwife really only watches you and your baby for two or three hours post-birth in a lot of these situations. Mm -hmm. And then they're gone. They might come back the next day or the day after. In your experience working in a hospital, why would you say it's necessary to have that continued care for more than just two or three hours after birth? Well, what normally is done in a hospital is they'll take the baby's temperature and vital signs, breathing and temperature um, and heart rate every 15 minutes for the first hour, then every half hour for the second hour, and then every hour for a couple of hours, sometimes up to four hours after that, just to make sure the baby's transitioning well. And that's also how often that they'll check the mother's vitals and bleeding and check the her uterus and everything like that and you know I'm honestly really not sure how that protocol got started but I have seen hemorrhages occur after that protocol is finished so you're looking at about four hours and then the mother goes on what is continue is um regular postpartum care and um but I've seen hemorrhages occur after that hour and I've seen babies tank after 24 hours. That's why they're not released from the hospital until they receive their 24 hour care where they do their cardiac testing and their hearing testing and everything like that. Do you have very often like um, C-section moms? Yeah, yeah, we have our fair share of C-sections. Some are planned, some are not planned. Um, <laughs> I, it really does seem to be, I've always um, kind of rebelled against this, but the longer the birth plan, the more likely a C-section. 
<laughs> I've, I've come to start to believe that. So I remember just a couple of days ago, there was a, a young couple that came in lovely. They wanted a low intervention birth and it went on long enough to the point where she ended up getting a C-section and it was a necessary C-section. And um, that's another thing that I hate too. Um, midnight quarterbacking of a midwife saying, oh, you wouldn't have had to have a C-section if I was your midwife. <sighs> um, yeah. <laughs> And I remember turning to him and saying, why is it the couples who most want a natural birth so many times tend to end up with a C-section? And he said what I've known all along and it finally started to accept the longer the birth plan, the more likely a C-section. But the thing, the thing is, a C-section is not failure. And that's something that I've um, had to go, you know, talk about mothers with too. You know, they, you know, we're talking about going back for a C-section because very frequently I'll call it. And I'll pick up the phone and like, all right, I'm ready. How soon can you get here? And he's like, in the car, <laughs> you know. And But only after I've talked to the mom and made sure that she understands risks, benefits, why we're thinking this way. It's her decision. It's ultimately, it's her decision. But by the time we get to that, she's usually pretty ready. And I've had a, a couple of times a mother look at me and say, I feel like I'm not, um, I'm not really giving birth or I'm not really a mother because I'm having a C-section. And my response to that is probably not very professional. I'm like, are you kidding? This is badass. You're willing to go through major abdominal surgery to bring your baby in the world. What could be more motherly than that? And that tends to make him feel like, okay, yeah, I'm badass. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I hate this. And I get this with breastfeeding too. Uh, a, a mother who feels like she's failing if breastfeeding isn't working out for her, you know, or she's failing if she has to have her baby surgically. It just makes me crazy. I don't want any woman to feel like she has failed. And I think that's where in the natural birth world, and I was part of that world too, we contributed to those feelings of failure when honestly, and I tell women, about, I should start <clears throat> telling this about c-sections but i tell women about epidurals they feel like they have failed with epidurals and i usually have this discussion with them before they ever go into labor there is nothing wrong with an epidural an epidural is nothing more than a tool it's a tool that you choose to manage your labor no one can tell you you must not have one no one can tell you you should have one it is your decision and that generally helps mothers feel a little bit better about making a choice. I've had mothers look at me and say, okay, Kim, I want my tool now. <laughs> like, okay. And, right. And what, <clears throat> talking about that long birth plan and <laughs> it's the way, it's the totally opposite way of looking at it. Cause it, I can see what happens is you don't, you say no to all those tools at, at the beginning can help you get that vaginal birth. And then you wait till that last minute. And since you didn't do whatever, get the epidural and then, right. you know, get that, you just, then it's now it's like either urgent or even emergency. Right. And it's, right. if you want to compare it to what like speech therapy for your child or any kind of therapy, you know, if you start at age three or before, well, then you've got a great leg up. Then as someone who's starting, oh yeah, we realized that, you know, this child has a speech impediment and they're in fifth grade. Well, then you have to undo everything instead of right. working at age three. And, you know, I think, you know, parents can understand that, but they can't understand this other way of, you know, they think the cascade of in in interventions, it should be the celebration of <laughs> schools, you know, or some sort of better word that says, these are those positive things that are the tools. It's in the, the tools that you can. And the reason you do them is to get the vaginal birth. If you do, right, you exactly. I, them, it's like you do I not can't. pass go, go directly to C-section. <laughs> you know, so why don't, it's like, okay, well, you don't want any of that. We're just gonna get the C-section. You know, it just seems to me. I can't tell so, you so opposite. how many times uh, a mother has gotten an epidural. You know, things are just not getting anywhere and she's exhausted and, you know, I'll suggest it, you know, Here's a thought. You, why not try an epidural and see if you can get a nap? 
Oh, I won't be able to feel the baby push. Well, if you're not able to feel the baby push, we can turn the epidural down. We've got some flexibility. And again, it's your choice. It's not a decision you have to make, but sometimes just getting a little nap in, getting a second wind makes it work perfectly. And sure enough, you know, she's hung up at around six centimeters or so. It, nothing is going anywhere. She's exhausted. She gets that epidural. She gets a nap. I get a nap. Um, <laughs> and the nurse is calling me in a couple of hours and saying, she's complete. I'm like, yay, let's go have us a baby. You know, it's great. I have a, I have a friend um, that I grew up here in Vegas with and She's a set of twins, actually, and they're both pretty natural um, girls. Like one of them I was alongside of in the natural community here in, in town. It was part of how I got into the home birth community. And the other one wanted to do a home birth, had picked her midwife. I went to her appointments. I was like a part of the process of everything. And um, something happened. I think it couldn't be covered or something, maybe by insurance or something like that. So she ended up having to get a doctor. And so she was pretty bummed out about that, but she was like, well, I'm still going to have my vaginal birth. And so she went to the hospital and she's whatever. And, uh, I was supposed to be there and it ended up being this big mess of whatever that happened. And I wanted to be there. Uh, I, apparently her sister was there like natural, natural, natural. We're going to have this baby natural, 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 no epidural. The nurses kept saying like, you should get an epidural. You should get an epidural. She was not like going any further she was just kind of staying but she was like i'm gonna have this natural birth whatever and finally at some point she was getting exhausted a nurse came in was like look this is it this is your time you can do this like you know like you should you should do this you don't have to be in pain and so she was like fine just give it to me and so she <laughs> got it and apparently right after that she was so relieved and so comfortable literally she had her baby like within like the hour or something crazy it was like fast like she yeah, was fully dilated had her baby and so it was just it was such an interesting I called like she calls me from the hospital and all I remember this is like right after she had her baby she's like epidural epidural <laughs> when you have a baby get an epidural epidural <laughs> epidural and she, was like, oh. and she was like Oh no, I don't care what anyone says. Get an epidural, get an epidural. And I'll never forget <laughs> that was from my, but her, her sister was so mad at her for not going natural, but the nurses and everybody was so happy because she did have her birth. And later on, cause I wasn't, you know, I didn't have any babies. I wasn't anything at that point. So I didn't understand it. I was just like, okay. Tell me. And then later on, I look at it as we don't have epidurals like to make us feel bad, to make us feel like failures. We have it for pain relief. We right. have it so our body feels comfortable enough to actually be like, oh, you know what? I don't she doesn't matter. Like, you know, it's just, it's the things of the interventions that they talk to talk about. It really is like to prevent you from that end thing, unless it's absolutely necessary. But right. it's like, you have all these options, all these choices. We can do A, we can do B, we can do C, we can do D. We can do all these things. So you do have a vaginal birth because if it was all about C-sections, we wouldn't have any of those options. And you just go in and the doctor would be like, take him to the OR or we're in C-section, you know? So it's, right. how often do you guys end up using, um, what is the pit? I always use it that? afterwards, after okay. the placenta comes out, because I feel like that's a... It's standard active management of um, third stage labor, which I'm a believer in. We're saving lives because of it. We're saving lives all over the world because of it. So I use that. Um, if a mother's not progressing and her membranes, well, let's start, let's back up again. If her membranes are ruptured and things aren't going along, we'll start a little bit of Pitocin. Um, if she's 39 weeks and she wants to have a baby, We'll do some cervical ripening with Cytotec or, or a balloon or something like that. And then we'll start some Pitocin. Um, so we use it a lot, but again, it's a tool. You know, if a mother's getting exhausted, you know, if she's not making efforts with pushing, sometimes we'll start a little bit of Pitocin and that'll be just enough to give her uterus just the oomph that she needs that with her own efforts, she can get the baby born. Again, it's it's a case by case basis. We yeah. do do. I don't know what our rate is. We've got a fair number of spontaneous labors, but we've got a fair number of inductions. If I've got a baby that's 
eight pounds at 36, 38 weeks, I will plant the seed. You know, hey, we're looking at a baby that's going to be nine plus pounds here in a couple of weeks. What are you thinking? And I'm not a big fan of um, 39 week inductions because the cervix just usually isn't ready to go then. But within a week, the two weeks, the body's usually pretty ready to go. And if things aren't happening, um, especially once we hit 41 weeks, then I talk induction. And I don't know what um, the numbers are, but you know, I seem to have a fair amount of mothers that get to 41 weeks and then I get antsy. <laughs> and I have to try to not show that I'm getting antsy because there's a good number of people in this community that think, ah, 41 weeks, no big deal. But I've seen a lot of 41 week disasters. <laughs> and I just want, don't want to go there. So yeah. um, I frequently have mothers that are disappointed, but I'll say to them, you know, I wouldn't be a good midwife if I didn't tell you what my, if I wasn't honest with you about what my reservations are. And mm. at that point, it's their decision. Now, do you do VBACs at your hospital? We do. And that's one of the things that I think is so unique about my hospital. We are a level one hospital and we do VBACs. Mm -hmm. And what we do is uh, right at about 20 weeks, if a mother has had a C-section, we make sure that um, she's consented for a VBAC. We talk about the risks versus the benefits. We also talk about the risks of a C-section versus the benefits of a C-section, because I think I've said this before earlier in the program that... Um, <clears throat> there's more risks to a C-section after labor than there is if you're just going straight into a C-section. And so we get their records, the physician reviews them. If he feels that she's a good candidate for a VBAC, he sends the records to the v, the OB committee. We review them or the doctors review them um, in the OB committee meeting and approve or disapprove of the VBAC. Then um, if they approve the VBAC, then once the mother comes in in labor, once she's six centimeters, there has to be a surgeon in the hospital. So he gets to come in and take our, our one call room. <laughs> I usually end up sleeping on any bed I can find anywhere. Um, sometimes the bed outside the OR. But um, you know, he, he needs, the surgeon needs to be in the hospital once the mother is at six centimeters. So we're, I think we're pretty unique in that, but it works, t tends to work out pretty well for us. Um, I don't know what our rates of rupture are. I haven't seen one since I've been here. We do um, um, occasionally do a little bit of Pitocin, but you know, we're watching very, very closely. And there are so many signs of a VBAC that's not progressing normally you know, that there are very subtle signs of rupture that you look for, you know, like was the baby coming down and now all of a sudden the baby's not coming down, you know, things like that. So we're all very well versed in um, what to look for. And so far that, there, that I'm aware of, there haven't been any bad outcomes with the feedback. A, a significant portion of them will go back for that second C-section though too. Mm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about inducing, like if you guys do any type of inducing or trying to kind of help labor along for, for a VBAC, trying for, to try to try to do whatever you can before it's like, okay, you have to get a C-section. I was going to ask you that. If, if we can, if the cervix is ripe enough to try a little bit of Pitocin, we will. But if the cervix isn't ripe, at some point you have to call it because we can't do any cervical ripening protocols with a VBAC. It's just not, I think you can use a balloon. I haven't had to do that yet. I'd have to look up the research on that, but you can't use anything like Cytotec or anything like that. That's a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. See, I had, um, when I could have had a VBAC, but I decided it not to. Um, my doctor's down here and then my doctor's up north. I asked him and I was like, his kind of just like what you had just said about 39 weeks. I was like, I don't want to hit, I don't want to go overdue. That was my biggest fear was going overdue. It wasn't trying for a VBAC. Everything. It wasn't. Yeah. So I was like, I don't want to. So I was like, do I get induced? Like, can I get induced earlier? Like 39 weeks when you would do a C-section, can I get induced? And uh, the, the doctors were like, we don't induce, like we don't use, you know, we don't use Pitocin for, uh, for a VBAC. They were Some like, we could do 
we could do the balloon. They said, if you're at a certain stage, whatever, we could try the balloon, but we don't do that for a VBAC because there's just too many risks and we just don't want to, we don't want to rupture. We would rather just have you do a, a set, scheduled C-section. So, uh, so that's what I was told down here by a couple doctors. And then when I went up north, that's what they told me the same thing. And then we end up like not going that route anyways. Cause I was like, I don't even want to take any chances. I don't want to no, even not. hit 40 weeks. 39 weeks is perfect. Just like get baby out. That's all I wanted. But yeah. so I was, I'm very interested to hear what other people's protocols are for that, because I've heard a lot of doctors will be like, maybe I'll try a balloon or maybe if you go into labor, you do, if you don't. Um, oh, another thing they offered me was if I was going to try for a VBAC, I could schedule out my C-section day. So whatever, if I was scared, cause I was like worried about going overdue, they said, we can do 40 weeks. Yeah. Like literally your 40 week, we can have your scheduled C-section be at 40 weeks, which I thought that was nice, but then yeah. I didn't even go for VBAC. <laughs> so I didn't yeah, I've had mothers ask me if they come in and labor, um, can they just go ahead and try and labor, even if they've already se- scheduled a C-section? And if they've been approved for VBAC beforehand, sure. Yeah. You know, um, so again, it's just an individualized thing based on her risk factors and what's happening at any particular time. But if her cervix isn't ripe at 41 weeks, it's time to call it and go have a baby. Okay. Now, what do you guys look for? Um, what would be your guys' like, what's the good signs of the signs that you would use for a VBAC? Like, what is actually kind of looked at to be like approved or even to be looked at from the board? You talked about the doctors looking at it. I'm curious, like, what are the things the, that you want her to be the criteria? The, first, the reason for the first C section. Um, if the reason for the first C-section, and I can't say this specifically because I'm not the physician, we're not, the midwives aren't the ones making the decision, but if the reason for the C-section is something that's likely to repeat, like CPD, um, they may um, tell a woman, you know, if you insist on doing this, we will work with you and, and you can labor, but it's not likely that the outcome is gonna be any different, particularly if it's a bigger baby, you know, or if it's a baby of the same size. So we look at the reason for the first C-section. If it was like for a breach or for twins or something like that, it's not something that's likely to repeat. And then um, the type of uterine, clo- uterine incision that they have, it has to be a low transverse incision. Uh, the type of closure, they prefer a double layer closure. Um, some women have not had that and they've still had successful VBACs, but that is their preference. That's why we always ask to see the operative report so I mean I heard that and I didn't understand that you actually just explained it well because it sounds weird but I had my um c-section in Vegas and when I went to another doctor because I didn't go I couldn't go back to that doctor for my next baby because he only delivers at the same place that I have my baby and I was like there's no way I'm I'm going back to the hospital yeah so I would have went back to him because he obviously knew my body knew my baby knew everything so I went to another doctor and when we were talking about VBAC she could pull my records, but well, she knew my doctor and she's like, I know his work. Like, I know like what he does. I know how he does his C-sections. I've done C-sections with him. So I was like, oh, so they were like, you're a perfect candidate. Cause I know exactly he does his in a certain way, which that's what he explained to me. I did your, your, your incision in a certain way and stitch you up in a certain way that you could have a V-back if you wanted to. And apparently my doctor, which is, is really interesting because I went and had my second C-section, she did a, some other similar stitching or something where it's possible that the doctors down here, because they came back, they were like, you could have a, you could have a V-back. I was like, oh, heck no, I'm not having a V-back after two C-sections. <laughs> but you know what I mean? But they still were like, yeah, because of this work and this work, the way that they were done and the way that your, do- your doctors were. And I, I, you know, I'm not medical. So I was like, I don't know what that means, but that's nice. But no, I'm not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so, no way. Another thing that tends to work in their favor is, and again, I think this goes back to, is it a situation that's likely to repeat itself? If they've already had a vaginal birth and then they've had to have a C-section, then they almost always qualify as long as it's the appropriate um, incision to have a trial of labor yeah. for the next birth. Yeah. 